Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. This week I'm going to be doing something I've yet to do on this channel before and that is a Bible study. I originally wrote this lesson for our student group because on week two of our counterfeit series I'll be speaking and leading this but I really felt like I needed to do this as a video as well because more than just our student group needs to hear this like everyone in any stage of life always needs to be reminded of their identity and their identity in Christ and then also how to find that as well as what we're mainly going to focus on today is like the counterfeits that are presented throughout the world. How our identity and who God says we are can get skewed and it's very very subtle in how it gets skewed so it's really easy to fall into believing those lies but today I was just going to share with you guys how to know the counterfeits and also know the truths that combat the counterfeits. So we're just gonna go ahead and jump into that today. So basically what really made me just sit down and think about this was just remembering that one, we're imperfect people, but then also the people around us are imperfect people, which means we have an imperfect view of everything like just slightly skewed because we aren't capable of seeing it perfectly. That means that our perception of ourselves and how we see others is also skewed. So with an inaccurate perception of ourselves from both us and others around us, how in the world can we be expected to deliver an accurate representation of our identity without something to come in and tell us what it is in the first place? And that's where the Bible comes in. Basically, like Satan just likes to come in with counterfeits all the time and give us totally different, slightly skewed, but different and wrong um, perceptions about ourselves that are really easy lies to believe. So the first few things that he does that through are competing voices. There are a lot of competing voices. The first three are media, friends, and family. So with media, especially when it comes from secular people that are famous or have large platforms on media and secular just means not Christian. Um, we kind of get very skewed messages, various messages about who we should be, what we should do, what we should like and what we should wear. So I feel like most people know that, that we shouldn't trust media or that it's just a highlight reel or you only see the good stuff and then it makes you feel like your life is skewed because it doesn't look like that. Like we know that but not always do our actions show that we believe that. And I feel like that's a really big thing. It's just not just saying you believe it, but living it out. Media can be really good, but it also can be really bad. So just have discretion for who you follow, what you see, and then also what you choose to allow to influence you because it can have a large impact on your identity and on your feelings of self-worth. Another form of like media, I guess, would be horoscopes. Honestly, horoscopes are whack. Like, they're not even scientifically sound, first of all. They're definitely not biblically sound. It's just a computer-generated system that produces vague perceptions about your day or decision-making or whatever, and it really just relies on tricking the human mind to make people believe that it's real. It's called priming. It's a psychological thing where you want to find that there's some sort of truth in there. You will then be more prone to search and find truth. Even if it's really not applicable to you, your brain will then compensate for it and say that it's real. If you believe that they're not accurate and you step back and look at it objectively, you'll realize that it really is just a vague, messed up, inaccurate, whack sort of a system. A second competing voice that we can listen to quite often would be our friends. So basically, friends may know you really well, but God will always, always know you better than anyone else on this planet because he created you. And he doesn't just know you as in like what you've been doing that day and how you're feeling about a certain person and what problems you have in school he knows like your inner thoughts every thought that comes through your head that you can never tell a friend because there's just way too many of them he knows who you you were created to be he knows your passions even if you don't know them and can't express them and we mainly find this in jeremiah 12 3 and that verse says as for you lord you know me you see me and you test whether my heart is with you also we can know that god knows you in your deepest thoughts and feelings because in psalm 44 21 it says would god not discover this for he knows the secrets of the heart that no one else does and there you have it the third competing voice would be family 
Their intentions may be for good, especially your parents, but they're still human. So they might let their own desires for who they want you to be or what they want you to do get in the way of really speaking life into you of who God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. So if they ever say something that rubs you the wrong way or makes you feel bad about yourself or something, go to God about it. Don't go to another friend because they're probably going to have the same opinion as you because when you go to God, you realize whether or not you are just being prideful and you need to be convicted and that they were right. So most of the time your parents are right, but there are times where they say that you should be a certain person or act a certain way and that might not always be biblical. So just line it up with the Bible. Line up everything everyone tells you with the Bible. And if you're confused on it, go to someone who knows more about the Bible than you do and just really just take what they say. And if it doesn't line up with the Bible and it really does hurt your feelings, not hurts your pride, but hurts your feelings, there's a difference. Then just know that that is not something that you should take into account that should rule your identity. So basically, media friends and family aren't bad. But when you allow their opinions to come before God's and who God says you are, that's when it becomes unhealthy. Next, our desires get in the way from allowing us to really achieve our true identity in Christ. The first one is our desire to be accepted. So the counterfeit presented is that being popular means you're accepted. Now, this isn't always true because first of all, just because you're popular doesn't mean you're accepted. It just means people know you, but it doesn't mean they actually like you. So there's that. And secondly, God's truth says that you are already accepted, that there is nothing that you should do or have to prove or a status you have to achieve in order to be accepted by him. And we know this because in John 6, 37, it says, all that the father gives to me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So basically, once you come to know Jesus, you're set. Like, you are already accepted, and there's nothing you need to do to prove yourself otherwise. Also, our desire to be fruitful gets in the way from us really achieving what God means whenever he asks us to be fruitful. Because a counterfeit that is presented, which honestly is really hard not to believe, just because everyone else in the world literally lives as if this is truth, but... Being successful or wealthy is a way of showing your fruitfulness. While this might be true, it's really not because when God talks about fruitfulness, he talks about fruitfulness as an overflow of the heart or of the spirit of what's on the inside, not an overflow of your wallet or your house. Godly fruitfulness is not like tangible. It's not something you can pull out of your pocket and be like, look how fruitful I am of the Lord. No, it is something that is shown through your actions, through your attitude, and through what you do and how you present yourself. And that is found through a healthy identity in Christ. If you don't have a healthy identity in Christ, you can't be expected to produce godly fruitfulness out of your heart. And this brings us to our own insecurities. Now listen, everyone is insecure because we are all imperfect human beings. But we do not have to let our insecurities drive and define our identity. You see, insecurity is based on feelings, and Satan tries to use our feelings to warp our identity in Christ. But what I always have to tell my own self and my students is that feelings do not determine our reality, and they shouldn't be trusted in the sense that they should not be the driver of our decisions and the driver of our identity. They can be a passenger that we account for, but they should not be the one thing that we allow to really set us in motion into any sort of direction. But the thing is that our identity should not be mainly rooted in what we do or what we like about ourselves because those things are bound to shift and change as life goes on. Because if we root ourselves in those things and find our identity in those things, when those things change or life happens and things have to stop or things become shifted, then we feel like our identity just got rocked and we don't know who we are anymore. And that is just such shaky ground to be living on because God has already presented us with a different solution, a solid solution, one whose foundation is completely bedrock and not to be shaken. And that is just where we need to find ourselves and find our identities. Because when it's found in things that we do or things we like about ourselves, 
it's bound to be constantly shifting because it makes us feel whack whenever we don't know what to do with ourselves or who we are anymore, which then influences our actions, which then makes everybody else feel whack about us and about themselves. And it really just does not create any sort of healthy environment for ourselves internally and for those around us. So the real question is, how do you figure out if your identity is rooted in the wrong things? What I like to do is ask myself like an anecdotal question, which is if I lost blank, would I still feel like myself? And fill in the blank with any person, place, thing, or ability that you might place your worth in or that you feel like you spend a lot of time investing into. As an example, whenever I used to dance a lot, I very much found my identity in being a dancer and in my ability to dance and in the fact that I had a really good body because I worked out like 20 hours a week and I was super in shape. So in my blank, I would put, if I lost dance, would I still feel like myself? And four years ago, it would be no, because I did not know what to do with myself without that. And for you, it might be a sport. So put any sport in there. It might be a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a best friend. And if you feel like you wouldn't feel like yourself if you lost that person, then you might be finding yourself rooting your identity in the wrong thing. So if you answered yes to any of those things and you realize that you're probably living out of a version of a warped identity, you're gonna wonder what to do next. Well, the simple part is that any version of a warped identity all stems from the same few roots. What God revealed to me while I was writing this lesson is that if Satan can get you to feel alone, every other root of a version of a warped identity can be connected to that. And God revealed this to me whenever I was reading 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, where it says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers around the world. So God tells us that the only way, or at least the main way, to really resist the devil when you're going through any trial of any kind is knowing that you are not alone in experiencing these trials. But if Satan can get you to feel alone, he can get you to believe these next five identity counterfeits. First one, that you are unloved. Second, that you are unwanted. Third, that you are unforgivable. Fourth, that you are untreatable. And fifth, that whatever you're striving for is unattainable. Now, if you ever have felt these things or if you do feel these things right now, I'm gonna tell you right now that all of those are false, that you are not unforgivable, that you are not unloved, and that you are not incapable of anything mainly because God has presented us with truths that totally counter all of these lies. You might feel like you are unloved, but you need to know that that is not true because in Romans 5, 8, it says, but God proves his own love for us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So even at your worst, God still came down and he died for you because he loves you. And you might feel unwanted by anyone or by a specific person, but it really doesn't matter what those people make you feel and if they do make you feel unwanted because God says that you are chosen. Because in John 15, 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit, that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask in the Father's name, I will give to you. So, he may not like you back, she may not like you back, they may not be the nicest friend or whatever, but, that really does not matter because they may make you feel unwanted, but God says that you are chosen by him. Also, you may have done some things that make you feel like you are unforgivable, but that could not be farther from the truth because in Romans 8, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is nothing in the world holding you back from being forgiven besides your own feelings of telling that you're not forgiving yourself because God has already come down and forgiven you despite you not even realizing it. Next, you may feel untreatable. This was totally true for me whenever I first got diagnosed, where, especially whenever they said it was incurable, uh, all the things that I had, where I just honestly felt like there is nothing anyone could do for me, there is nothing that could change me, and there was nothing that could make my life better. But God came in and reminded me that he says that I am a new creation. We know this because in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. 
don't worry, I totally did not throw my Bible. That was more just like a mic drop moment because there's so many times where we sit and tell ourselves that we can't change, that no one can fix us, that we're just a hopeless case. But Jesus came in and said otherwise because he said we are a new creation who is forgiven, loved, and chosen. So your feelings don't matter because what God says about you is just over all of that. And lastly, there may be times where you really feel like whatever you're trying to do is unattainable because you're simply incapable. But in Philippians 4.13, God tells us that we can do all things through him who gives us strength. And although that's like a cliche verse that everyone puts on their graduation cards, it's deeper than what it has been made out to be at times because it really just goes down to that if God has called you to do something, that means he has also promised to equip you for it, that he has made you capable, and that not just through your own strength though, but that he has called you to be capable through him because he loves you, he has chosen you, he has forgiven you, and he has made you a new creation. So to wrap it all up, if you can realize and also point out all the identity counterfeits that you have allowed to manifest in your heart and in your spirit, you can then learn to replace them with these truths. And that's really just the goal of the Christian life, honestly, is just to be so rooted in Christ that whatever comes your way doesn't even phase you because you know that your God is bigger. And it's just really hard to walk through this life that is just filled with constant ups and downs of trials and then praises and trials and praises and all of that stuff if you are living out of a very skewed identity and a very skewed perception of your identity. So I really just pray that you take these truths to heart and that you apply them to your life because it is going to make your life so much easier and it's going to make your relationship so much healthier and it'll make you such a more productive person for the kingdom of Christ. And that's really just the goal for anything is to continually better yourself so that you can be better used by God in every area of life he has set you in. So it all kind of comes down to if you don't have a good identity, you're not going to be able to be used as well as God intends you to be used. But it's all your choice on whether or not you want to pluck out those counterfeit identities and replace them with truth. Well, guys, I really pray that you guys liked and enjoyed and learned something from the video today. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this video for more Bible videos like this.